My name is Andrew Harvey, and my co-author Richard Griscom sends you all of his greetings from Leiden University. Today we want to take you through a century of research on the Hadza, the people, the language, and the culture. This is the cover page from a report written in 1914, 105 years ago, and represents one of the oldest works at le- to treat, at least partially, uh, the Hadza. Fast forward to 2017, and doctors are weighing in on a so-called Hadza diet in the Hindustan Times. A nomadic hunter-gatherer people who speak a click language, the Hadza people are a highly salient group within the Tanzanian Rift Valley area, and have been a focus of academic inquiry for over 100 years. With a focus on the often interrelated fields of linguistics and anthropology, this talk traces the academic discourse on the Hadza people, and specifically how the former has helped shape our conceptions or misconceptions of the latter. A dominant narrative to emerge is that of the Hadza people as members of an insular culture who have undergone minimal change. We would like to show how this concept has made its way into popular imagination of outsiders, and the effects that this has had on the Hadza people today. We will then show recent challenges brought by linguists to this dominant narrative, as well as why doing so is important. To begin, uh, I think it's important that we situate ourselves within the research context. Uh, Both Richard and I are postdoctoral researchers at the Leiden University Center for Linguistics in the Netherlands. Richard, pictured here with Hadza Consultants, has a, a research focus on language documentation, fieldwork methodology, and functional typological linguistic description and theory, especially as applied to East Africa. Richard has been working with Azamjeg de Togo, which is a southern Nilotic language in, spoken in the area since uh, 2015, and uh, Hadza, our topic language right now, uh, since 2017. I'm interested in the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their formal morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as events through language uh, contact and linguistic arts. Uh, I've been working with uh, Gorwa, which is a South Cushitic language, since 2012, and began working with Ihanzu, which is a Bantu language, in 2018. Uh, And I began working with Hadza uh, this year. Both of our projects are funded by the Endangered Languages Documentation Program, based at SOAS, University of London. As a quick note, a recording of this talk will be made available online at the DOI above, or can be watched directly on YouTube. So, to give some further context, Hadza, also known as Tindiga or Kangeju, is a language isolate, which means that it is unrelated to any other known language. Uh, The Hadza people have lived in the area surrounding Lake Iasi for a very long time indeed, certainly longer than any of their modern neighbors. The area of land that they inhabit has decreased significantly in recent times, however, due to the increased presence of other groups of people. Uh, No dedicated survey has been conducted to determine the number of Hadza speakers, but based on demographic surveys, Hadza is spoken by around a thousand people. And this is an image of uh, Mariamu Anyawire, uh, who uh, I met in 2015 and who was my first introduction to the Hadza language. And I'd like to thank her for her patience in letting me ask a few questions about uh, her language. And to get an idea of what the language sounds like, this is a recording of Gudo Mahia telling a story. Bebe ena atone na ishokoko ta denke ya kama kwa muta titi ya kota kuku tula ita kama atone na tlo 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 saka metam. So, as mentioned, uh, academic literature on the Hadza people stretches back over 100 years, and as such, what we present should be viewed as a curated selection of this. Um, A more complete list of works can be found in the Rift Valley bibliography, whose reference will be given at the end. And when laid out in a timeline, we can review some of these major publications and see some eras or movements corresponding with the wider cultural and intellectual climate of the day. Um, So, for example, much of the earliest work is authored by colonial explorers. Uh, The first-hand account of the Hadza coming uh, with Irik 
Obst's 1912 report, in which he spent eight weeks with the Hadza. The uh, mid-20th century sees the rise of a more recognizable modern anthropology. Uh, James Woodburn's 1964 dissertation is still seen as sort of a locus classicus for much of what we know of the Hadza society today. Um, the late 20th century sees the advent of evolutionary anthropological approaches, perhaps the most significant contributions being made by Nicholas Blurton Jones. The early part of our century sees further attention in this vein, now with the addition of modern genetics. Uh, interested in, uh, so geneticists interested in the Hadza's uh, genetic lineage. Across this span of time, uh, we can see the emergence of a dominant narrative. So, against early suggestions that the Hadza were a mixed group of individuals who had absconded from neighboring groups, uh, which were ideas reported, though not fully endorsed by Obst and Cooper, 1947, for example, and uh, so that the Hadza were sort of these abscondees and they had no language. The, the literature sort of establishes uh, the Hadza and the academic discourse as a separate group with a distinct language, culture, and history. So Dorothea Blake writes about the Hadza language in 1956, for example. Uh, so not only that, uh, the Hadza sort of being recognized as, as their own people, as they should, um, but the Hadza were further seen as a uh, culturally conservative society um, and with a highly divergent DNA which suggests an early break with other modern humans and therefore a very old genetic lineage. Um, this sort of coupled with the Hadza's perceived resistance to outside influence and practice of a hunter-gatherer mode of subsistence was a basis for which to consider them a useful proxy for the study of early man. Uh, Frank Marlowe, for example, defends this position in 2010, saying that the term living fossils, uh, if stripped of what he sees as a misplaced prerogatory connotation, is a fitting term for the Hadza in describing their utility for the study of the human past. Um, understanding how we've come to see the Hadza in this way relies perhaps less on the Hadza themselves than it does on an academic debate occurring on the other side of the continent. Uh, the Kalahari debate, which uh, occurred mainly in the context of the Kung people, uh, hunter-gatherers of uh, southern Africa. Um, this was an exchange uh, which began in the 1980s about the nature of the past of the Kung. Uh, and from one side of the debate, the traditionalists uh, said that the Kung sort of are viewed as historically separate from neighboring groups, an isolated and independent hunter-gatherer society. Uh, for the other side of the debate, uh, the revisionists, the Kung have not been separate but have played important economic roles in neighboring groups and that their current isolation is only a contemporary phenomenon. Note that during this time, Nicholas Blurton Jones worked with the Kung using Richard Lee's data and was introduced to the Hadzabe by Lars Smith, one of Irv DeVore's students. And it's important to note that Richard Lee and Irv DeVore were among the most prominent of the traditionalists in the Kalahari debate. Um, and, you know, academic pedigree being a rather weak indicator of theoretical orientation, it, it's best to judge Blurton Jones on his own writings, uh, which more often than not, they tend to resemble traditionalist views from the Kalahari debate. So, for example, in his 2016 book, he writes that we know from Hadza genes and language that their ancestors maintained themselves distinct from other populations for an extremely long time. And it seems reasonable to suppose that ancestors of the Hadza were living by hunting and gathering in the Iasi Basin for many tens of thousands of years. And furthermore, throughout the 20th century, day by day, Hadza have little to adapt to but their environment and each other. Frank Marlowe, a student of Blurton Jones, vociferously defends the traditionalist narrative, writing that the importance of the Kalahari debate for this book is that the revisionists heralded a postmodern, unscientific school of anthropology. And even in conceding the significant contact uh, the Hadza had with neighboring groups, he argues that the essential trait of their cultural conservatism still makes them useful analogs for thinking about the past. So he says, the Kalahari debate turned 
on how much contact the Kung had with their Bantu neighbors, as if this crucially determined how pristine they were. This seems unnecessary from my Hadza-centric perspective. The Hadza have had considerable contact with agricultural tribes for some time, yet it has not changed their daily lives in such a way that undercuts their relevance for thinking about the past. Societies that continue to hunt and gather with bows and arrows resemble the societies our ancestors lived in more than industrial societies do. This is an inescapable fact. It makes them interesting. It makes them valuable for evolutionary research. And indeed, it has been this narrative that has continued to present and has, has fed into and has been fed by popular conceptions of so-called primitive people. So, for example, this microbiological study of the Hadza gut microbiome found that the Hadza have richer gut biomes than Westerners, and their biome is different in significant ways from other African populations that do not hunt or gather. Uh, their methodology was to follow the Hadza around for two weeks, collecting their poo, desiccating it, then expediting it to Bologna, Italy. Never mind that their comparison uh, African farming populations were in Burkina Faso and Malawi, so far away that it makes one wonder whether if they can claim that the Hadza are indeed somehow special in comparison to other non-hunter-gatherers. After all, it seems uh, to me that without sampling nearby non-hunter-gatherer populations, one cannot rule out that the Hadza gut microbiome is shared uh, across the area, for example. And, uh, of course, going back to their rationale for conducting this rather invasive study on the Hadza, rather than other larger and perhaps less vulnerable populations in the immediate area, was while the Hadza are a modern human population, uh, they live in a key geographic region for studies of human evolution and target resources similar to those exploited by our hominin ancestors. The Hadza lifestyle is therefore thought to most closely resemble that of Paleolithic humans. And hence, we find the Hadza in the pages of the Hindustan Times. But it is harsh to judge researchers here. After all, one cannot control how non-academic news outlets interpret your findings. Except that this pattern seems to be repeated even in a university's own publication. It doesn't help here that the academic interviewed, uh, not associated with the study above, I should add, but with another on the Hadza, uh, it says that uh, while nobody lives exactly like humans did 10,000 years ago, uh, the Hadza way of life is perhaps the least changed. And so, resultantly, media takes are not uncommon. The BBC in 2017 stating that it's thought that the Hadza have lived on the same land in northern Tanzania, eating berries, tubers, and 30 different mammals for 40,000 years. And soon, the narrative is seen as a lucrative opportunity, so this tourism company blog stating that the Hadza people are deemed to be the last real hunter-gatherers on Earth. They are speculated to have lived in their current territory for around 10,000 years, and various genetic studies have concluded that the tribe is not related genetically to any other people on Earth, meaning they are extremely unique. If you are thinking of visiting Tanzania, uh, don't miss out on the unique culture and valuable life lessons uh, that can be learned from the Hadza, which they follow directly with CR deals to travel to Tanzania. The natural conclusion of such a narrative is this. A young woman who has paid to visit a camp near one of the main villages, and whose face I've, uh, and, and name I've blurred because her identity doesn't really matter. This is quite common. Uh, so you should note how her experience is framed. Her home video is a documentary. Uh, the takeaway from her one-day package side trip are findings. So, when your hosts are somehow stand-ins for Paleolithic man, every encounter is for science. And, you know, the impact goes beyond rather demeaning misunderstandings, though. The Hadza are a vulnerable community, and the ways in which mass tourism affect the Hadza are well documented. So, Jeremy Coburn mentions how tour guides compel Hadza to wear traditional-looking clothing, or even to use more cliques around tourists, where, in some cases, the Hadza people will simply make up strings of gibberish. And Gibbons describes the impact as toxic. Constant visits disrupt hunting and gathering, uh, alter settlement patterns, and leave the Hadza exhausted from constantly entertaining guests. Uh, cash brought by tourists is often spent on alcohol, which has emerged as a major health crisis. 
One researcher reports a Hadza woman telling her, My body is tired. I'm tired giving my hair, my poop, my spit, my urine. I'd now like to return to the timeline and discuss ways in which the dominant narrative is being challenged. Um, but first, uh, why we might want to challenge this narrative stems from two major impulses. The first is merely academic, a conception of the Hadza which allows questionable conclusions to pass as sound ought to be scrutinized. Um, and the second has to do with our responsibility as researchers. There's a clear connection between the concept of living fossils and outside interest, which leads to unsustainable levels of tourism and intrusive research. It is therefore important for us to question this narrative and explore other realities which may be equally supported or supportable by evidence, uh, other realities which may turn out to serve the Hadza people better than the current one. Um, and as a linguist, I've been trained to work from linguistic evidence, and as such, this is the material which I will use in the following discussion. Um, the first aspect of the dominant narrative which may be challenged by linguistic evidence is that the Hadza language itself suggests an ancient lineage of people. Um, the earliest evidence of this concept is probably found in Dorotea Blake's 1956 Bushman Dictionary, in which Hadza is classified as a member of the so-called so Khoisan languages, thus linking it to languages spoken throughout southern Africa by peoples known to predate Bantu-speaking populations. Uh, this is convenient in that it rather neatly places the Hadza within the familiar trope of a hunter-gatherer society which speaks the Khoisan language and is a member of an ancient lineage. Except that by 1998, linguist Bonnie Sands shows that the evidence for considering Hadza as part of the so-called Khoisan group is simply not clear enough uh, to do so with any certainty. So as such, the link between Hadza and the Khoisan group must be jet jettisoned in favor of Hadza as a language isolate, that is, a language seen as unrelated to any others we currently know. Despite this, the discourse quickly adapts, replacing Hadza's Khoisan affiliation with the fact that it is a click language. A genetic paper, Knight et al., 2003, explains that since the Kung and the Hadza are maximally genetically distinct, and since both people speak click languages, uh, then clicks uh, may be more than 40,000 years old, quote, and that clicks are, quote, an ancient element of human language. And this fed back into the work on the Hadza. Um, Blurton Jones indicates that though we cannot be sure who inhabited the current Hadza homeland in the deep past, their language, quote, must likely have contained click consonants. So, though Hadza has been disproven as a member of the Khoisan group, its usage of click consonants gives it some claim to a similar degree of archaicness. Linguist Tom Guldeman uh, convincingly argues that this uh, attempt to make a linguistic argument based on DNA evidence is not sound according to the current evidence that we have, namely that shared inheritance is only one uh, option out of several regarding, on, regarding how Hadza may have ended up with clicks. Uh, Guldemann writes uh, that Knight et al. 2003 seems to be inspired by the outdated default assumption that linguistic, genetic, and cultural features correlate, and thus achieves, first of all, to perpetuate the old stereotypes about African groups speaking the relevant languages. This is the first assumption which, working from linguistic evidence, must be thrown out as a given. Another concept uh, present in the dominant narrative is that the Hadza have not been influenced by outside groups in any meaningful way. Uh, this is a point we have seen defended in, by Marlowe and uh, is a key reason for the gut studies, for example, such as Schnorr, to have chosen the Hadza as a study population. Again, linguists find this concept rather puzzling, as there is ample evidence in the language, both in its words and in its grammatical structures, that the Hadza are and have been in contact with neighboring groups. So, in fact, Gudelman raises the fact that the profile of the Hadza click inventory does not rule out a situation in which they developed in Hadza as a result of language contact. Furthermore, Kiesling, Mouse, and Nurse state that, depending on how you measure it, Hadza shares between 67 and 87 of 
percent of uh, proposed linguistic aerial features common to the Tanzanian Rift Valley. And in comparison, a, a control language like Swahili, which is not a member of the linguistic area, scores between only 35 and 57 percent. percent. Finally, and as, as an example of a more recent contact, Kirk Miller finds that the majority of Hadza kinship terms are borrowed from neighboring languages. I see this, therefore, as serious cause to re-examine the assertion that the Hadza have somehow not been influenced by outside groups. And finally, I'd like to address why examining these alternative narratives is important. Um, in a situation in which many of these arguments may seem very detailed or unnecessarily abstruse. So first, from an academic point of view, it's about scientific rigor, so subjecting the work that has come before us to analysis to see whether it stands or whether it needs to be revised. Uh, from a social justice and indeed a decolonial perspective, it's important to recognize, as I think we've made clear in our talk, that the Hadza, throughout the 100 plus years during which they've been studied, have often been presented through one lens only, that is, as a population used, useful to Western science as a proxy for our distant past. And this rather totalizing view has made the Hadza subject to a range of abuses, both uh, of an epistemic and of a more physical kind. And so what these alternative narratives can do, therefore, is one, serve as effective means through which to test the veracity of the view that the Hadza are the conservative society that they have been made out to be, and two, to inspire a different kind of narrative in the popular imagination that, though the Hadza are very different from us, their history has still featured the dynamism, change, and adaptation witnessed by all other societies of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area, the rest of Africa, and the wider world. Thank you, and here are my references.